Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. This is another episode of STS. That's right, STS is back in your life. You didn't know you needed to have it, but you had to have it, and we're here to give it to you. Yeah, and you probably forgot about it. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. Yeah. All right, so I think before we get back into uh, the, the show, uh, which was a show that we, we did just talking about current events, uh, and I'm kind of alluding to what <laughs> I want to say, but there is a reason why we stopped doing it. And that is one of the reasons is that there's not actually a lot of current events all the time in parkour. And we're going to try to uh, continue to do this show, maybe not commit to once a week, yeah, we maybe were, not we commit were, to anything. Maybe we not. were doing it once a week. Yeah. It was uh, we were regularly scheduled broadcast. Yeah, but um, but yeah, we we uh, <laughs> we found it hard to uh, to keep up with the non-existent current events happening in parkour. Um, and then there was a bunch of current events that we just glossed over because we fell out of the habit. Yeah. The other reason is, is I really like doing this show live, mm -hmm. and I I do like you're gonna see it. It's gonna pop up if you're subscribed to this channel. You'll see it. It'll be, you know, live stream about to happen the next day. We, I really want to get back to doing it live because no one else does that. No one else in, yeah. in parkour is doing like a live podcast or web stream show. And I felt like that was a cool thing we were able to provide for y'all. But some of the tools that we had at our disposal to do that left. Uh, and now we actually have some more tools. So like we got the little lab mics. I like using the lab mic instead of a, you know, condenser because I can, I can... You can move, move around. I can go take a break over here right now. I could be like over here. You're like, hey, we're still doing the show and you can still hey, hear my voice. Stay, and, they can still hear and, you. And I'm back. Okay. All right. So that's, that was a nice update that, that allowed <laughs> us to, you know, be able to, I just, I remember coming to you one day like, Tom, I think we have everything we need to, you know, do it again. So, so from a technical or yeah, t technical standpoint, we can, we can do this sort of thing again. And, and I think from a place of understanding. We can do it again. What does that even mean? <laughs> well, understanding that, that we don't have, you know, the, the uh, we don't have to commit to weekly. Oh, and we don't have yeah. to always be about current events. There are other things we can discuss. That's true. We can discuss things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, I mean, for the uninitiated, I think we should talk about who we are. Okay. I think, yeah, that, that is topic number one. Topic number one. Who, who we are, why you should care about this show, maybe. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, I mean, we shouldn't get too deep into the origins story. But, uh, but yeah, so, so uh, who are you? What, do you uh, what, what, yeah. what is your background with parkour? Yeah, uh, my, my name is, is Rene uh, Sauvignon. I was going to say Sauvignon. Sauvignon Blanc? Yeah, every yeah. time I have to buy wine, it's like, that's my name on that wine now. Uh, Renee Scavington, uh, do you, if you can spell that in the in the comments, one letter at a time. <laughs> Boost that engagement. Yeah, us, give us please. give us some comments, and uh, maybe maybe you can win something. Maybe maybe this shirt. Should, we, should I just stop saying maybe? Yeah, you win if you you if you can spell my name one letter at a time in the comments. Unbroken. Well, <laughs> You will, you will, uh, whoever can do that first will win this uh, cool mint chimp shirt. Cool. Cool mint chimp. Yeah. But back to me. Yeah, back to you, please. Tell us. Uh, I've been doing parkour uh, for a long time. So I started back in like 03. Uh, at the time where it was embarrassing to talk about how long you've been doing it for. So, mm. so it is, it is kind of murky waters to think about when I actually started, but I, I did catch wind of parkour back in 03. And yeah, it was always kind of a goal to uh, have a gym and a space to, to be able to do parkour at. So I opened up Origins Parkour in 20 well 2011 is when i signed the lease 2012 is when we officially opened and those those are my those are probably my two biggest things i also started coaching in 2006 so 2006. i was i was uh, officially doing classes and paid to do them in 06 learning the ropes and i i also do um, personal training i spent i spent some time just you know training regular folk how to do strength and conditioning and that sort of thing, but I don't really have any official credentials around that. No letters next to my name unless I wanted to put maybe BCRPA, which is the uh, uh, 
certification you get in British Columbia for, for uh, passing a necessary amount of information to teach people <laughs> how to be in a weight room, I suppose. Uh, but other than that, it's just always been a passion, uh, both parkour and strength and conditioning. Awesome. What, what about yourself? What do you do? Ooh, okay. Well, I guess we'll start with my name, too. My name is Tom, uh, also known as T-Money. Uh, uh, you know, one or two people have called me that at least once. Nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have never called you that. Yeah, please don't. So... Uh, I started parkour actually in 2007, so it's actually quite a bit of time after Coach Renee. A couple years. years. I feel like that time gets shorter over time. Oh, for sure, yeah. So I was I started in 07, and uh, I was an adult. I was 19 years old when I started. Adult. Um, and yeah, so what happened? So I started. I, I originally I was like the original one of the original members of Florida Parkour. So. That's where I'm from, and I uh, taught or led group sessions in uh, at my university for a couple years before moving to Vancouver, which is where I met you at a Sunday Jam, um, and you asked me how much I weighed. You love telling that. That's your favorite <laughs> favorite thing. I don't know if you if you can tell by watching this, but I am he much heavier than Tom, and we're close to the same height. I walked up to him and I said, "Hey, uh, hey, you're uh, Renee, right?" Uh, he, and he was like, "Yeah. How much do you weigh?" <laughs> that was. Uh, and that's the not rest that is way. history. It was pretty saw, close to that. Come I on. I saw you do. I was always, I was very into. Uh, <laughs> I was very into weight at the time because I, I had spent several years trying to get bigger because everything that I had been reading, watching, consuming around like sport performance was always like bigger, stronger. Mm. And I was, I was above 180 pounds at that time. I think I was somewhere between 180, 185 um, at like five foot eight, five foot nine. And I was, and I was probably about 130 pounds at the time. Probably less. I think you were probably like 125. <laughs> so. So I'm just looking at this specimen, Kong this wall, and kind of fly over and, and land really nice. And um, I, at the time, again, I was kind of struggling with this thing because because and it did lead me eventually to lose some weight. Uh, mm. it, where it was just like, okay, I shouldn't be trying to be this heavy. I should be a little bit lighter for parkour, as it is an anti gravitational sport. You got it. So part of that weird obsession at the time, just it felt like an appropriate greeting, you know, just, uh, hey. Well, that got me. That try got it. Me. You guys should try it out there. You should, you know, next time you walk up to someone just, you know, at a jam, just be like, hey, how much you weigh, man? What's, uh, you know, what's, what's shaking in it's there? The, it's the start of a beautiful relationship. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, you, you got me into actually putting weight on. So, like, I actually, like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I actually tried to get up to like 150 pounds. And you had, to, you I, had I, to fit in with the scene. I did, but it actually helped quite a bit because it, I was doing quite a bit of strength training and I put a foot onto my broad jump yeah. through that training. So, and a foot, that's 12 inches, or uh, I don't know what that is in the metric system. Yeah, but, tell, tell them about the results. <laughs> uh, a whole foot onto a broad jump, which is actually quite a huge increase like for a pretty short period of time of, of training. So it helped me to put on some weight, but uh, I actually, 150 was too heavy for me. I actually like pruned it down to about 140, 145 mm -hmm. is where I kind of baseline now. Um, anyway, so I moved to Vancouver for, uh, for grad school originally. So I actually, uh, I completed my master's in kinesiology and I studied uh, motor learning and skill acquisition, some, uh, some coaching science in there. You got some letters next to you? I have letters next to my name. So it's M. Kin, Master of Kinesiology. And, uh, and then while I was here, this is when you decided to open up Origin. So I helped you build the space, and I was around since the very beginning. And was that, so the year that we were building, was that when, like, you were still in school? I was still in so school. So you were just, like, popping by? Yep. After school, on a, well, neglecting school. Well, at first, at first, that was like pop, I had a, I had that little training space. Yeah. And and you were popping by there to do workouts. I was training. So I would see you almost mornings. every day out there. And then, and then when I signed a lease and we started like demoing and construction, you were just popping by to, to help out whenever you had time. Exactly. And uh, oh, actually, even before that, I was I was volunteering for PKBC. Yeah, we to were doing coach the, outdoor outdoor sessions. Yeah. So uh, so. And then it wasn't until 2012 when we officially opened and I started 
coaching here, that's when my professional car parkour coaching career started. And again, 2012, so that's like nine years or so. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I guess that's the origin story. So <laughs> the two of us, we're both coaches in parkour, and we've been mm -hmm. doing it for a, quite a while now. And, uh, and we coach all demographics too. So we coach kids and we coach adults. And we're not above that, right? I'm not. Ab I, I don't know. I like. <laughs> I, it's it's been uh, th there's there's growing pains with that. Mm -hmm. There's growing pains with uh, like when before opening the gym, I was exclusively coaching teens and adults because the the previous uh, previous uh, spaces that I was hired by to to coach that that was the program. And then when I coached outside, you know, like just kind of like guerrilla style. We're not going to be like, bring your five-year-old, you know? Yeah. And then we opened the gym, and it was like, yeah, like, you know, I heard that this is, uh, this is where the money is. Yeah, it's all <laughs> it's, in the kids, right? <laughs> it's coaching the kids. kids programming. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, this actually, it kind of leads me to, uh, to the interesting question. Um, it's, a, it's a meme throughout the parkour world or right, parkour so we're, coaching this, world. This is, I'll just say this is topic number, what are we on now? It's topic number three <laughs> of, today's, of today's show. Uh, yeah. We have bullet points that we're going through mm. right now, um, but the uh, the uh, the meme in parkour coaching culture is that you don't have to be a, a high level practitioner or a, you don't have to be a great athlete or an advanced athlete to be a good coach. Um, and I guess well, I'll prompt you: is that the is is that is that true? Do you think that's true? Well, there's another saying. What's the saying? That, that isn't like in parkour, but it is. Uh... It's it's less flattering. Oh, it's I know the, what it those, is. I know what you're. Those who say. cannot do teach. Yes, yes. <laughs> those who can't do teach. That's true. Um, very, very, very true. Very real for me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, yes. Yeah, very, oh, yes. Very real. That's uh, very real. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, he has a knee injury. If you didn't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, is that true? I want I want your 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 thoughts on this first. Yeah. I mean, there's so many ways you can go with that topic. And I, I, but before we did, before we started recording for the show, I, I was hesitant about even talking about this because I feel like as soon as you start talking about this topic, it, it's, it's defensive. It's like, yes, I'm coaching. Yes, I'm not the greatest at parkour. Uh, I, I do think I'm, pr I'm a pretty good coach. And I do think there, there are things that I can see from beginner to, to elite where I could give helpful coaching for yeah. both of those things. Yeah. Uh, but, but I don't think it's, uh, I think when people, I think it comes off defensive sometimes when people bring up this sort of topic where it is someone who maybe isn't very good at parkour and, you know, they're kind of using it as a way to, to prove value, which it, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, because it's not automatic. It's not automatic that, hey, you're not very good at parkour but that's going to make you a great coach. And I think the feeling there is that if you're, and that there is some, there is some uh, truth to this most likely, is that if you, if you had a tough time learning something, this is always what it kind of meant to me, is if you had a tough time learning something, you're probably going to be better at coaching it because you can identify with your students more. Mm. And, and I think that's true for like your general population and your beginners, which is, you know, makes up the bulk of people that are going to enter a parkour gym and want to have coaching. The bulk of your coaching is not going to be coaching the elite. Oh, it can true. build up to that, but the bulk of your coaching is going to be beginners. And so if you can't relate to them on some level, you're probably not going to be very good at coaching. Like if everything came super easy to you and, and you're just, you know, walking in like, oh, I'm going to teach people how to do stuff, you're, you're going to have to learn what's going on like in their, in their head, in their bodies. And again, if it was super easy for you, you're probably going to have a harder time doing that. Not impossible. You could still be a good coach. You could, you could be both. You could be a good athlete and a good coach. Yeah. So, I, I mean, th the big thing that we need to kind of discuss here is we need to like, draw some lines. I think we need to ask some, some more questions that are mm. a little bit deeper, right? So what, um, what demographic are you teaching? Are you teaching kids? Are you te teaching adults? How large of a group are you teaching? Are you, is it just one-on-one? -on -one? Cause like I've learned so much from high level athletes just by them telling me like one little tip about something. But 
are they necessarily going to be the best group management coaches, right? And so there's there's elements to coaching that are uh, uh, that you have to kind of identify to decide whether you know are you going to be good at all of these things or just one little segment of it. Um, an, another question is, um, well, you know, can you can you be a uh, uh, can you learn something from a high-level practitioner that you can't learn from just an average practitioner who is a coach? And that's that's another question. Do you have do you have any thoughts? On Are that? you're asking me that question? Yeah. I I mean it's th there's nothing I can bring like objective to this conversation. <laughs> 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 it's all just like, this is how I feel about it. Uh, well, but let like, me but, reframe it. Yeah. Have you learned anything from somebody who's a high, a high level practitioner? Have you learned some, have they been able to teach you something? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, and I think that that has a lot to do with like in the, but it isn't, isn't through a formal coaching session. Right. Typically. Uh, and a lot of times I'll reach out if I'm not sure about something and someone's like a high performer at something, I'll often reach out through like through a DM or something, just to ask them, like, you know, do you have something, you're really good at this, do you have something that you think makes you really good at, at that? Uh, and again, that's the kind of thing that it might be able to trickle down to teaching beginners, or it might just be something for myself or for coaching. Cause, because the, the goal, one of the goals for me with coaching is like to coach people to be better than me. Mm -hmm. And and I've been able to do that in some uh, in some aspects for you know some people that we coach. It's like oh, okay, like I was able to coach this uh, this young man now, and now he's better at uh, you know running pre's or lashes or whatever than I am now. Uh, can I say that across the board? Not yet, and I, that's that's kind of my goal. It's also my goal to not let that happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I kind of feel like I end up in this this uh, scenario where it's like I want to coach someone to the point where they're better than me across the board at everything. Uh, but I also want to keep getting better so that that doesn't, doesn't happen, yeah. you know, like doesn't happen anyways in, in the well, short you're term. You're trying to balance out being a, both a coach and an athlete, right? Yeah. You're trying to improve yourself. Well, it, it gives me two goals. It gives me yeah. two goals. You know, it yeah. allows me to be a, like, have like this sort of competitive mindset for myself, but also just want to be better at coaching and want to be able to, mm -hmm. you know, get someone past that level. Well, yeah. So I, I think ultimately coaching is a skill. And in order to be a good coach, you have to develop that skill. You, you can't just, you know, be a great athlete, show up and be like, I'm all, all, so all of a sudden going to be a great coach, right? It's going to take time to progress that skill, just like it took time to progress your jump or your, you know, Kong or whatever skill or your climb up, right? Yeah. Um, so this kind of leads me to uh, a topic that I want to I wanna kind of talk about here, which is... Um, I believe that there is an incredible amount of implicit knowledge in parkour. And what I mean by that is like, there's like so much that athletes can do now that they are implicitly aware, aware of. They know how to do just by doing it because they've practiced it and they've, they've, they've gone through the reps and they've figured out in like this intuition of how to measure distance and how to land on a wall appropriately how to stick a landing how to swing on a bar mm -hmm. but a fraction of that is explicit knowledge so what i mean by that is of all the total knowledge of parkour there's only a small amount of it that we can actually translate to communicate mm -hmm. um, and because of that i think most people are terrible coaches because when you're practicing, you're not constantly translating what you're doing into explicit knowledge. You're just practicing and trying, and you know, maybe you'll try, be like, oh, maybe I should try to put my hips this way a little bit more and that'll help. And, and maybe that's a little piece of explicit knowledge, but then you tell that to somebody else and it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because they don't have the reps and the implicit development that they've worked over, over time to create that knowledge. And so, um, uh, so, and, and so ultimately, um, I think most people are bad parkour coaches. Uh, so that's not just high level parkour practitioners or athletes. 
it's also it's also you know the people who consider themselves coaches are probably also bad coaches it's you know do you know are you familiar with the Pareto principle no Pareto principle is basically like uh, eighty percent of the results are produced by twenty percent of the population. Oh, that one. Okay. Right. So, <laughs> so <laughs> most people can't be great coaches, right? So only a small percentage of people are going to be great coaches. The rest are going to be mediocre to bad, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so it doesn't matter if they're a high level practitioner or if they're somebody who's been coaching for you know a few years or they they fancy themselves as a coach they're likely to be bad based on the, that principle, right? Or they're likely to be not great based on that principle. And so that's like the, the way I think about this is, uh, can good athletes be great coaches? Yes, but they also have to train the skill of coaching to do that. And they are probably also likely to not be great at it. <laughs> but can bad athletes be good coaches? That's a good question. And I think there's, so bad athlete or like not, or like mediocre athlete? Again, hard to talk about this objectively. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so in order, I think in order to, to be a, a good teacher, you have to have at least some base knowledge of how things work. So you have to like, I think you have to be at least mediocre, like, like an average, an average practitioner, you know, um, which is, <laughs> which is, how do you define that? You... Um, I mean, you should have it like, you should have the capability of executing some of the fundamentals or all of the fundamentals and, uh, even at uh, a small scale. So not necessarily like, you know, a massive lache or a, la a massive running pre or whatever, because that's ability that can that can be trained or is potentially inherited genetically. So you have to, you have to have a base level of skill in everything to be able to at least communicate it. When you get to certain skills, like there's flips that I cannot do, but I can give tips to somebody who's working on them and it could potentially help them. Um, but it's, because I think I, I have a foundation of a lot of the fundamentals and an understanding of how a lot of the flips do work that I'm able to translate that knowledge. Um, yeah, con con conversely, there's you, someone, I've, and I hear all the time, in an open gym, at the gym all the time, always got my ears open, I'm, a, I'm an eavesdropper. Mm -hmm. And I hear bad coaching between people oh, yeah. all the time. And it's usually someone who can do something quite advanced and they're trying to rush their friend to achieve the same thing mm -hmm. and giving them way too much information. Sometimes not even like the bad, it's not even bad information. It's just too much. It's too much yeah. or just not right, the right timing mm -hmm. or, or, or not the right, or just not the right cue for the situation. Right? So, Ooh, this is, brings me to another we, topic. We, we can go into a big thing here. I, okay, what's your what's what's well, the other? Well, so you you have to understand that as a coach, you can make things worse. Yes. <laughs> um, and by and just by filling somebody's head with way too much information, providing a cue or a drill at the wrong time, mm -hmm. or just the wrong intervention in general. Yeah, I think I think the best way to explain this too, because I think most people that are that are watching this, I mean, some of you might might coach, but you're also probably a practitioner. And you think about if you're doing something hard, uh, what does it feel like to be doing something hard or just doing something new? You are there are two there are two big things going on. One of them is if it's something new, there is probably an element of, of fear related to it. And two, you can only really think about one thing outside of that. You're so, cause you're folks. So, so the fear is not allowing you to feel like it's easy. Like you have that feeling where like you're afraid, it feels really hard as soon as you knock out the first rep on something or like achieve, I don't know, a, a jump, a scary jump. All of a sudden you're like it's easy now it's because you've let go of the fear you've let go of some of that inhibition and you can actually relax and your your body can perform you can use like the 
this part of your brain. We're not going to get a super technical with that, but you can you can do it. Um, but really, you can only focus on one thing. I can't like I can't be like approaching a Kong and think about okay as I'm running you know in slow motion. Here's the part where I'm going to drop my hips down now, and here's the part where you know I'm going to set my arms back, and here's the part where I'm going to focus on aiming this part of my body. You can't do all that. Mm -hmm. It's happening in real time. It's not happening in slow motion, and so. When you're coaching someone, you can't expect them to grasp all those things. You got to, we, you know this, and I'm preaching to the choir right now. But, but you got to be just giving them one thing until they really have that one thing down to the point where they're not thinking about that one thing anymore. Then you can give them a new thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where most people go wrong with coaching. And I, and I think about just de developing as a coach myself, and the amount of times, as you said, where you can make things worse. And I'm happy to report that I don't make things that much worse anymore. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, and this will happen where, you know, you'll be coaching someone and I'll realize I said too much anymore and I'll, I'll have to tell the person to like, okay, try to clear your head. Mm -hmm. Try to clear, okay, forget everything I just said. Forget mm -hmm. it all, forget it all. We're going to start fresh. Hopefully you, you, <laughs> you can forget it all yeah. because now I realize I've said the wrong thing or I've said too much and I just want you to focus on this one simple thing instead. Yeah. I mean, there, I mean, there is times where I'm coaching somebody and I'll tell them something and, I, and I'll tell them also after that, this will probably make it worse before it makes it better, right? Mm -hmm. Because then you're, because then, because they have to recalibrate what they're thinking about and then, and so, you know, their expectation shouldn't be that what I told you is going to make it better. It's, you know, their expectation should be that, okay, this is what I'm going to focus on and I'm just kind of recalculating my, my positioning or whatever it is that I told them and, and. And then over time, as they work through that skill, it'll hopefully make them better. Right. But but coaching is uh, is an art as much as it is a science, right? There's, mm -hmm. you know, there's principles that you can follow to uh, to increase somebody's performance. But no one, no no two students are the same, right? There's, uh, you know, some people interpret things so literally that. Uh, that it's you know you have to be very careful what you tell them in the first place and some people who you just say one thing and you kind of say it vaguely and kind of poorly and they they get it first like with the first rep after so it's uh yeah it, it's interesting like this i actually i tweeted this a while ago but um i said, said you use twitter i do Dang. i do All right. at tom jumps underscore i think um <laughs> but the tweet I said is, uh, it's easy to be a great coach when you have uh, exceptional students, mm -hmm. right? Um, because it makes you feel good when you say something and you say it kind of poorly and they still are able to do it exactly as you wanted them to do it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, and then you feel really good about yourself. Man, I'm a great coach. Uh, when in reality, it's just you have a great student. and. Mm -hmm. Kind of balancing those things out, but I guess so. The reason uh, this kind of came up as a as a topic was, uh, you know, you have places like Woodward who fly out, uh, you know, high level athletes to be guest coaches. Um, I, I know Ed Scott was recently brought out to a gym, uh, flight free one free run or something like that, to be their coach. And uh, and I'm sure there's like great things that can be learned from high level athletes. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I learn from high level athletes whenever I practice with them, whenever I am around them, or even just like watching videos of them sometimes. It's just, just watching them move. It's like, oh, I understand that move a little bit better now. Um, but, but are they going to be necessarily the best? Um, like, if you hire them to be a parkour coach at a parkour gym, teaching the regular program, are they going to be a great fit? And I think that is up in the air and it's really dependent on the person and it's dependent on what their experience is with actual coaching. Yeah. I, I guess for, for me, like the last thing I want to say about this is uh, from, a, from a business standpoint. So as someone who um, has owned a parkour gym for uh, so al almost 10 years, mm -hmm. or almost 10 years been, uh, been open now and made a lot of mistakes from like opening and hiring just just kind of like the the people that were prominent in the scene, which were actually like the more talented athletes, and felt like they wanted to be part of it. I don't know, 
like, and I could probably say like for the most part, they didn't really, they weren't really actualizing what it is to be a coach, right? And the things that they would have to do and some of the things that might not be enjoyable to them right away. And some people like yourself, who's one of those guys, uh, you know, maybe fell into it. Maybe there's parts of it you didn't enjoy at first or didn't think you would enjoy that you enjoy now. And, and that's the biggest thing. Like if you don't enjoy it, you shouldn't be doing it. And part of that is, you know, teaching kids. And some people don't like teaching kids right away. Part of it is teaching people that don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. You, if you're opening up a parkour gym, you're going to have a lot of kids get dumped into the, your program that don't actually want to be there. And then you have to sell to them. And even with adults too, they could come in with the wrong idea. How many adults come in and are like, I want to learn a backflip. And you're like, okay, well, like that's, part of what we're going to teach you, but not like really the biggest part and not a part that, you know, I'm super stoked to share with you, but okay, yeah, we can make this part of it, but can I sell you on these other parts of it? And the other part I'll speak to you is, uh, is the, I want to, like at this point, I want to hire coaches that are able to have the most, I'll get really business with this, the most client retention. So the coaches that are going to for, and there's so many different ways they could do it, but the coaches where it's like, okay, how many, how many kids want to come back to your class? How many adults want to come back to your class? And how are you providing that? You might be providing that through personality. You might be providing that through like useful, insightful information. That's probably actually for beginners. That's probably the the least important part is like how much you know doesn't really matter it's it's more about like can you can you make all the people showing up for your classes across the spectrum of ages can you make them feel like parkour is something that they want to do and that and that like you care about them and you know like they they feel welcome Mm -hmm. (laughs) these are these are all like way more important than how many followers you have on Instagram (laughs) or what sort of feats you've accomplished because that means nothing when you're coaching people week after week maybe for like a workshop or something you know if you're a big name you could probably get a people to show up to your bunch of people to show up to your workshop and probably a bunch of them would probably just idolize you for a certain extent but there's a certain point where uh, if you're not giving back to them what they need they're not going to want to keep showing up yeah so that's most important can you get people to keep showing up and that's what's ultimately like in this game as it is right now, uh, if you want to work as a coach full time or close to full time, that's what's going to be most important. And that's what I'm interested in and in looking for when I'm, when I'm trying to hire someone. Great. Cool. You're so fired. <laughs> I think people like me. <laughs> they do. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt to show off a little bit in classes too, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, 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 it can be one of, again, it's, it's, there's so many methods to do it. And again, like me, you can, I think having people like idolize you and, and having that be like part of their big draw of returning can be super strong. That can be something that can carry you for a long time. But, it, but if that's all you have and you end up in a position like me mm-hmm. where all of a sudden parkour doesn't work for you, if, if all you had, they say this a lot in like the fitness industry where like if, if all you have is like your body and your muscles and your, your pictures on Instagram and then all of a sudden you're in an off season or injured and you have nothing else to post, what do you turn to? Yeah. And it's like if you were relying on just your ability for so long, what do you turn to when that's no longer a thing? You know, we might be one day, you know, we might be uh, like 60 years old still trying. I don't know. I'm going to be coaching kids at that point might get kind of weird i don't know maybe not maybe not 60 yeah maybe you know who knows who knows how long i'm gonna be still coaching for but um there could be, there could come a point where it's like yeah you don't you can't perform for people and that can't be part of your coaching so what do you do then yeah uh, that's that's a really uh poignant question yeah there. let's ponder that <laughs> oh boy I don't know. I plan on being a high-level practitioner until I'm 69. <laughs> All right. So, so can we move on to our last topic, which sure. is kind of a shorter one? Is uh, we wanted to uh, part of it. And this this kind of fits with what we're talking about with coaching and stuff. And both of us coaching for a long time is we would like to include uh, some of you watching this, and we want to do a segment that we are calling technique critique, and we would like to critique 
your technique and perhaps provide you with some simple information or try to, we'll try to make it as simple as possible that is going to help you improve. So it could be anything from submitting clips or even, uh, e even asking, I think, just, just questions about coaching. Uh, or not, qu not questions about coaching, but questions about being coached, <laughs> I right. guess is what I mean to say. Yeah. Uh, what, what else could people, uh, what, what would this look like? What, what, could they, uh, what could they give us? What could they send us? Uh, for us to critique. Yeah, it could be just like a, a video of their climb up, uh, you know, uh, it could be uh, just like a, asking a question about like how to stick a landing better or mm -hmm. something like that. So basically... Videos would be best. So if you can send us, uh, it, we'll, we'll say, uh, should we do DMs? I guess you could DM us uh, both uh, at Res Origins or at Tom Jumps. Uh, you could also send an email to me, Renee at OriginsParkour.com. Uh, if you want to fit in a video there would be a good way to submit. And hopefully next time we do this, we got some submissions and we can, we can do a proper technique critique. Excellent. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, and uh, hit the bell so that you know when we're actually posting videos. Yeah. Um, and we'll see you next time. We back and we out. <laughs>